Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guests, Gary Lindbergh and Jane Hollis. And they're here today to share with us their new book, The Power of Positive Handwriting. As a writer, film producer, and director, Gary Lindbergh has won over 100 major national and international awards. He's the co-writer and producer of the Paramount Pictures featured film, That Was Then, This Is Now, starring Morgan Freeman. Jane Hollis is a licensed psychologist in private practice. Using psychological testing for candidates for employment and promotion, Jane works with small to large corporations. She designs and facilitates team-building workshops based on personality assessment to promote cooperation, stress reduction, and productivity. And they're here today to share with us their new book, The Power of Positive Handwriting. So let's welcome Gary and Jane to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, what a joy it is to have the both of you here today. We have had the pleasure of having Gary on the show before to talk about his new book, Letters from Elvis, Shocking Revelations to His Secret Confidant, and what a great book that is. It's right before the holidays. Highly suggest this book as a stocking stuffer and a gift for those that you love. And we're here today to talk about something that I found very intriguing, the power of positive handwriting. So, you know, Jane, why don't we start with you? How did you, you know, I understand like you were inspired by positive handwriting by a trip to Vegas. Right. It was right after I graduated with a BA in psychology. And there was no mention of graphology in any of my classes. So I was in Las Vegas with a few friends, you know, celebrating the graduation. And we went to Circus Circus. And there was an entertainer there using graphology. And she was so dead on accurate. I thought she, oh, she, I even accused her of listening to us, talking in the background. But then I realized, well, we weren't talking about us or our careers or how we thought. And then I thought, well, maybe she's some type of psychic. But then she explained that she worked for a judge and it was a very legitimate science. But she had told me I'd be a great psychologist. And I thought I would be. But her validation, I think, helped me to go on. And she had told a friend of mine who was a football player that he'd be a great writer. And he said, oh, you know, I play pro football. I'm not going to quit that to be a writer. And she said, well, that's for now, but thinking of your future, you'd you'd be a good writer. So he went home, and he wrote a story for Playboy called Winner, and it was accepted right away. And then he got got into it, and he took a job as a screenplay writer in California and quit football. So everything kind of worked out the way she saw it working out. Wow, that that is just absolutely amazing. And mm-hmm. Gary, with you, so that, I mean, I mean that took you know, me going, immediately. Wow, you know, it, it's it's interesting how spot on this is. I mean, because and we'll get into this a little later. I was um, just blessed to have um, a handwriting analysis done by the two of you, and I am just wowed with what you guys have done. And so uh-huh. before we get into that too much, you know, Gary, why don't you talk to us about your influences with this? Well, I grew up in an interesting household. Um, my mother uh, owned and ran the largest art gallery in Minnesota, but she was also a master grapho analyst, as was Jane. Uh, so, And my father was a musician and a professional magician. So I had lots of creative stimulation in my life. But one of the the things I remember the most vividly is how hard my mother would work on when she was doing grapho analysis, uh, how hard she would work on, on the written scripts, the, the letters and things she was analyzing. And when she would uh, take her personality portraits to people, 
she was always, as, as you said with Jane, she was always spot on. People were so flabbergasted that she knew so much about them. Uh, but what I really appreciated about the way my mother handled this was the fact that she always found encouragement, even when she found what might be conceived negative traits in somebody's writing, uh, personality traits. She found a way of using it to encourage people and to exhort them to to make some changes in the writing. Uh, my mother was was one of the first proponents of this thing called graphotherapy, which is not just analyzing your personality as exhibited in your handwriting, but also reverse engineering it and using your handwriting through modification of, of the strokes in your writing to actually affect your personality. So in other words, uh, to change a, a, a tiny little stroke that occurs frequently in your writing in such a way that you can eliminate procrastination or things like that. And so I was always fascinated by it. The book, uh, The Power of Positive Handwriting, really was, the, was sort of a family project. My father did research on the handwriting of famous people, which are used throughout the book to demonstrate the, the traits seen in the handwriting of, of uh, Florence Nightingale and George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. But he also collected specimens from a lot of other people to demonstrate the different strokes in the writing. And it was one of the very first books in the country to be published on this graphotherapy uh, technique, how somebody could actually change their handwriting and change their life. So I grew up in a, in a very interesting household. <laughs> My mother has since passed on. And this particular book, uh, because of the interest in, in the Elvis, uh, letters from Elvis book, which is based on handwritten letters by Elvis and other celebrities, uh, there seems to be a resurgence of interest in the whole area of handwriting analysis. And so we brought in Jane to actually analyze the handwriting of Elvis, Marlon Brando, Harry Belafonte, and Tom Jones, and some others for that other book. She did a marvelous job. So we also asked her to write a new introduction for this book, which we've now republished, and to consult with us on updating some of the content. Well, how exciting is that, man? What a background. What a creative family to grow up with. And it seems like you were at the perfect place in order to really have this book kind of develop to what it has. You know what I mean? Yes. And, of course, I I had the opportunity to work closely with my mother, which was a joy. You know, I was sort of the, the wordsmith. I was not the handwriting expert, although I certainly learned a lot about it from my mother, but I was the person who was able to take her thoughts and her theories and put them into writing to try to make them understandable by the general public. And uh, so that remains my role. That's why I thought it was important to have Jane on this show because she truly is an expert in handwriting analysis. She is a master, master grapho an, uh, analyst and also a, a psychologist. Oh, and it's you both have such amazing backgrounds, and your mother was definitely ahead of her time. I mean, <laughs> she was working. She was in many ways, yes. <laughs> helping people to make that positive change even before they knew they can do these kind of things, you know? Yes. Goodness. Well, you know, so, Jane, why don't we start with you, and we're just going to kind of mm-hmm. break it down to basics here. So for our listeners sure. that are new to this, what is graphology? You know, what is that all about? Well, it's actually a science, and it has been well-researched. Now the areas of research are a little bit less about personality and character, which is what handwriting determines best more than any other assessment tool. And I have worked as a psychometrist at a hospital. That's a psychological tester. And for employers, large and small. And I really do believe that it is the best assessment tool for personality and character and the way people think. If they think slowly or quickly, if they are detail-oriented or see the big picture, 
which is, can be very important in employment or just the way that you lead your life. So. That is just it's fascinating. I find this whole, you know, how, how you can look at somebody's handwriting and really determine these different traits that a person has. I mean, uh-huh. a lot of us would just, I mean, it, 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 it's, um, in your book you talk about, in the book it talks about how simple and straightforward this is. And for a lot of people, it is. I think they it have all no makes idea. sense. Yeah. Uh-huh. Everything about handwriting makes sense. So, for instance, we take basics, um, like slant. If you slant your writing to the right, which you do in your analysis for your handwriting, then you're reaching forward and towards other people. If you slant to the left, you're more of an um, introspective, I'll say. And if you slant up and down, you're more objective. So you're not ruled by your emotions or you're not afraid of them. So everything kind of makes sense if you think of it. You can think it out for yourself. And pressure, we, we certainly an important point. So it's how hard you press your pen into the paper. And that means energy, mental or physical energy, and memory. And they're seeing now, so I was alluding to some of the research which is being done, that handwriting, people who write in school will retain the information much better than if they keyboard. And that's why many states, 11, are now mandating cursive to be taught in elementary school, which has just happened in the past couple of years. And about 15 more is it's on the legislative agenda. So it, cursive is coming back. And I think some of this is related in how we connect with each other. We don't connect so much because of the Internet. So we're losing it in both that way and in handwriting, which shows the connections, which is shown in only cursive, not in printed. We can only get 30 traits from the printed handwriting sample. We get over 300 from a written sample or cursive. But everyone, even though they say they only print, they will still find their name. So you can get quite a bit out of the signature, although that's how the person wants others to perceive them. So anyhow, uh, slope is another one, whether the person slants up, slopes upward on the page, or which means optimism. You can imagine up, upward, you're thinking up, <laughs> or more positively. If your slope is down, you might be a little bit pessimistic. And if your slope is even across the page, you're a realist. And in your sample, Marianne, you you kind of both. You have a little bit of optimism, a little bit of pessimism, but most of it is realism. So you're kind of in the middle there, but most of it is the emphasis is on realism and practicality. You've got great ideas, new ideas, but you see a way to bring them into practice. Uh, Otherwise, you don't think they're useful and may not even bring them up. So in form, if you rounded, means you like security. If it's dish-shaped, garland-shaped, you're apt to serve others. You want to be of service to others, which is so evident in your, your own handwriting. Oh, angles, which is uh, Donald Trump is the angular uh, signature, which most people are familiar with. That's goal orientation. Very quick thinking. So uh, rhythm and speed, that's how you can see if a person has impulse control problems. The rhythm is really off. And you'll see a lot of corrugations or blotchiness and muddiness and the writer. So that could be a sign of a neurological disorder, actually. So when I was doing personnel selection pieces for employers, all I would say is according to the rules of graph analysis, this person has corrugations in their handwriting, which may be a sign of a neurological disorder. 
because we can't tell what it is. It could be a sign of drug use or alcohol abuse. It could be a sign that they've had a stroke. It could be a sign of a seizure disorder. We don't know, but it's the red flag, and the employer then knows to ask the employees something more about it. And then size. Um, if the size is large, you can get the big picture. And that is so important, I think, for business owners that they get the big picture, depending on what kind of business it is. And if it's small, it's a sign of concentration and usually attention to detail. So I know I did a team building. One of my first team building workshops was for a large company. But they would pair their salespeople up to go out and do presentations. So I remember one... I had eight people on the team, but two of them worked together. And one had just very large handwriting, flourishes, and no attention to detail. And his partner wrote very small, very technical, very attentive to detail. So the friendly one would uh, make the introduction and, you know, um, talk the person out the client up to make them feel very comfortable. Then the technical person would come in and explain what they're really getting and answer any questions. And then the friendly person would close the sale and ask, ask for the sale. But one good thing that came out of that team building session is the one who had the big writing, he needed to move around. So he would always be going down to his partner's office and I thought, well, that's probably going to bother that, that guy. And he admitted to saying that he was not answering his phone sometimes when this guy said he was coming down. So he would close his door and pretend he wasn't even there, which it didn't offend the partner at all. He took everything very easily. But I think it was good that they got that out. And so many other bigger things came out, too, but that was just a little uh, thing about size, how it can differ, and but it can be, they can help each other sometimes. So as they say, uh, size does matter. <laughs> so I, exactly, so it does matter, right, mm-hmm. a lot. And those are In really... handwriting. <laughs> well, yes. like you're right, hey, Jane, right. Mm-hmm. In handwriting. Jane, maybe, 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 Jane, you can uh, distinguish for us two, uh, these two terms with which we've been using almost interchangeably. Uh, one is graphology, and the other one is grapple analysis. Okay, sure. Graphology is the generic term for all of handwriting analysis. And grapple analysis is a method of training. And it was very specific, uh, very well researched. Everyone learned the same um, learned in the same manner, so it was very standardized, right? Which meant we could do research because everyone was doing it the same way. There's been quite a few different methods of learning graphology. And if anyone is interested, they can look on the Internet. But what I would recommend is for them to read a few books on it before so that they would want to know the best route for them. Um, I always thought that graph analysis, when I looked into it, was certainly the best method for me, although they were very exclusive in not wanting you to pick up information on graphology, uh, people who practice graphology in general, because they had all different types of things that they brought in that were not researched. If somebody brought in a new trait that they thought was going on, graph analysis made you, or did the research themselves in order to put it into their program. So I did contact the American Psychological Association about 10 years ago to see what they had on graphology. And they came, they only had one letter on it, but it was about how they respected grapho analysis because it was so standardized and that that 
would make research possible, and it does. Mm-hmm. And we need more right. research. So, this is absolutely you know, my, bad. My mother, my, my mother always uh, used the analogy. She said handwriting is really brain writing. Mm-hmm. Because all of the impulses right. that move your the the motor muscles and everything mm-hmm. are controlled by one's thoughts and personality that derive from the right. brain. And they make a neural and path from the brain right down to the hand and fingers. But you know, people who are disabled and write with a the pen in between their teeth or even between their toes, the right. same thing. You get the same information. So it's really the neural Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, and that's it does go really back. remarkable. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the habits yep. that we form when developing handwriting, they do transfer back up because that neural pathway has been formed. And that's why graphical therapy works. If you write in a different way, that's going to change that pathway. And habitually, exactly. you'll write in that way. So My, my mother always compared um, handwriting to uh, the the brain waveforms you get as an output of an EEG, an electroencephalogram. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. That may, that that what you do is you it, with an EEG you attach uh, electrodes directly to the scalp and they pick up the brain waves and you get a printout of these you know these up and down peaks and valleys that can tell an interpreter, a medical person who's trained in that science. Uh, to spot different kinds of dysfunctions in the brain or injuries. Uh, but it's a portrait of what's going on in your brain. And my mother always used to say that for her, handwriting was like an EEG it, uh, for your personality. <laughs> your hand was the output, the printer that was printing out the, the brain waves. But it came out in, in the form of letters and words, but it was exhibiting what was going on in your personality. Right, and as I mentioned, research now is getting being done by neurologists and educators a, a bit more than psychologists, and they're actually finding that handwriting analysis can pick up on Parkinson's possibly earlier than uh, the medical tests that they use, yeah. which is a really yeah. a big finding. That's just so, amazing. I mean, you, you it is all that, mm-hmm. and then. Not only, you know, the fact that companies use it to kind of, you know, learn a little bit more about possible employees. Is this something that can also be used, let's say, if we're, you know, for our family members or let's say maybe a future, a future partner? Oh, definitely. In fact, during World War II, this is taught, well, before World War II, this is taught in all the major universities in Europe. And I think it was in Germany that people would send in the potential spouse's handwriting, even to faculty people at the university, to see how they would get along if the character of the person is okay, because they married before they even met the person sometimes due to the war. So... Yeah, it is used, and it's opposites do not attract in marriage. Usually, you're you're better off with somebody who understands you. Um, although you know anybody can can get along, but then you'll need much more outside stimulation or outside validation. If you're married to somebody who does not understand you, you're not going to get that validation or that compatibility. So. In the workplace, it's important to have differentiation, but most likely not so much in a spouse. Well, I, I find that completely fascinating. And, you know, Gary, I was wondering, is it possible for somebody to, like, disguise their handwriting so no one can see, you know, who it is? Well, um, of course, my, my mother did work for the FBI and various police departments as well as personality profiles for businesses and individuals. Uh, so she, she worked in this field that's called questioned documents, uh, forgeries and things like that. 
And um, as, as I understand it, Jane, and, and I'll let you mm-hmm. add what you understand because you've done this uh-huh. as well, that um, it's very, very difficult for somebody to disguise their handwriting or to forge a document uh, if the handwriting is analyzed by truly an expert who is trained in determining these things. So I'll, right. I'll let you complete that. Right. Um, I have done work like this because I was also a member of the World Association of Document Examiners. But I usually only do it for existing clients because it's not my area of expertise and I don't have the equipment. I Usually people have um, microscopes, that type of thing, and I'll have to sit for days looking at a letter E or whatever, and that's not me. I wouldn't be able to do that. So they have kind of a different personality. I could do the easier work, but not the things that would probably be used in court. So I'll turn that over to a professional, and there is something called NAID, National Association of Document Examiners, which trains people on that and oversees it. Very ethical organization. So, however, the ones that I've worked on were actually quite easy to determine if it was a forgery or not. I know I had Mm -hmm. one client. My first client was a car dealer. And he had somebody stealing parts, and he would change his time card to make it look like he was not there on days that things are stolen. So they, the company sent me over about 60 of these time cards. And I, this was the case. I looked at one letter, and it did happen to be the letter E, and maybe that's why I mentioned the letter E. I was thinking about this. But he wrote it in a completely different way as the person who was supposed to be there did. And I looked closer and there were erasure marks on it. So and I listed that along with seven other things because you have to have seven different um, strokes that are not related to the person's handwriting who says that their their writing is the same. And I didn't even go in. I just turned it over to the employer who presented it to the employee and his union, the union person who accompanied him. And they just, um, there was no way that they could deny it. It was so evident once they saw what they were looking at. So that's how I prefer to go about it. I know one time, one woman was really quite good. A pastor had sent me. Uh, It was a very threatening letter to he and his wife. And he sent me the original that he received and then the writing of the person he thought had done it. Then I asked for his own writing, too, because you never know. You know, people do want the outcome that they want. So... She was great. She changed her slant. Um, it's hard to change your pressure. You'll always find stop, start marks because the flow isn't even with a, a fake handwriting or when you're trying to disguise your handwriting. But she did everything really quite well. The thing is she underlined certain words three times and always the same length across and starting at about the same time in the writing. So it was just, and she did that on the original and her own sample that he had provided me. So I knew for sure it was her. And then I looked closer at the stop start lines and the rhythm and the margins, the, and the form, the basic things that she really couldn't change. And it was her. So she, she stopped. All they really wanted her to do was to stop, not to be arrested or anything. So It is hard to get away with anything uh, in the eyes of a, a trained handwriting expert. We, we had an interesting uh, number of letters that turned up in our collection. That, that the, the book that we published uh, the, earlier this month, Letters from Elvis, uh, 
is based on handwritten letters, 265 handwritten letters by four celebrities. One of them was Marlon Brando. And it's interesting because occasionally Marlon would be writing along and his handwriting would change a bit and another person would start to write in the letter and would sign the letter as Jenny, who was a, a, a dead girlfriend of Elvis Presley. And sometimes entire letters would be written by Jenny to their secret confidant, who, who all these letters were written to. So we turned over some samples of the Jenny letters written by Marlon, but as another person, as if almost he was, he was channeling this woman, and ask Jane to take a look at that handwriting. And, and maybe you can comment on that too, Jane. Well, right. And I, when I received the writings, I actually thought they were written by the same hand. So I checked, you know, for the basic things and thought, well, they were. They're similar enough that they couldn't have been written by anyone else. However, there were such differences. So, for instance, in where he wrote with the Jenny signature, there were X's. Uh, and within the writing, which always indicates that somebody is thinking about um, the loss of a loved one or about death, actually. And Jenny may have been dead. Um, there are some other stories within the book that suggest that, that she was. And the size of it changed. Um, but there were also traits that Marilyn possessed. So she... I don't know if I'm a believer in possession of a person, but at least there was a, such an influence upon Marlon that he was writing under her influence, possibly. And I know that Elvis certainly, like Jenny, was possibly in love with her. So Marlon may have been picking up her energy, I'll say, because energy is a recognized field of psychology. So energy, even transference, and Shigong, you transfer energy, that type of thing. So, and that's uh, accepted within psychology. So I do believe so in that. So he may have been um, influenced by her energy and then writing according to that. So different different things can certainly influence one's writing. I, I remember it oh, when... Many, many years ago when I was in the Army during the Vietnam War, and I would write home long letters to my mother, and sometimes she would call me back, and she would say, I just got your letter. Why are you so depressed? Right. And my letter was very upbeat. I was trying to, mm -hmm. you know, Make calm her, her fears for me. Right. And uh, she would pick up those mood swings that I was having, how depressed mm -hmm. I was being in the service mm -hmm. and the war and all of this. And so right. I started typing my letters before I sent them. <laughs> oh, no, really? <laughs> yes. But then, of course, yeah. I always signed them, too, so she could pick up signals from my signature. And so, uh, you know, it was very hard to put anything over on my mom. Right. Right. <laughs> Right. I don't feel like I know someone unless I actually uh, see their handwriting. And that, I, I'll forget names. I'm good at forgetting names, but I never forget a handwriting sample. So when I did um, personnel selection, a lot of car dealers used me because once you start getting referrals, you know, everybody gets to know you. And you become yeah. quite good at, you know, what you're doing for them because you know the company and what they're looking for. And car dealers are actually looking for honest salespeople. So, because they want you to come back to their dealership. That's right. And, yeah. So. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Gary Lindbergh and Jane Hollis in regards to their book, The Power of Positive Handwriting. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Oh, 
Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls. to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guests, Gary Lindbergh and Jane Hollis, and they're sharing with us their book, The Power of Positive Handwriting. It was interesting because you know, um, in my handwriting sample, you talked about the signature that's used as part of my branding. And I really mm-hmm. was very impressed what you said about that because, you know, like many people, we we use branding that's um, that's a font that you know we've got right. designers that they find and you know we, we find the best that we like out of the examples they give us and but it's interesting what that font says. It is. And yes. Should I comment a little bit on that? Sure, or, please do. Would you like me to? Okay, because your font is a bit, quite a bit different from your actual handwriting. So I, I think when I wrote you back, I mm-hmm. said you might want to change it because it is not like you. It, it doesn't give out uh, your personality and character. It's uh, very, if you would look at this font, you would think of a person who lives day to day, not not too interested in abstract thinking or new thoughts, and a bit self-conscious, which you are not at all, and repressed. The person does not like to open up with what they think, and that is not you. You say it like it is. You're very honest and very direct, but you're so very service-oriented, kind, and generous. So... The honesty, people believe you. You're so believable. So that um, the it, you're not too detail oriented, though, right? You probably make yourself. I do make work with details. Do the I have to do right. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you know, even yeah. for the show, you might want to 
delegate the, re- the real detail work to other people. Uh, you've learned to be well organized. You have a lot of interests, but you keep them organized. You don't let them become confused, and that would cause a real restlessness in your life. People with confused interests don't know where to go with what. They've mm-hmm. got too much going on. But you you can prioritize well. And you're not repressed at all. Um, should I say that you might, you have a, a way to tell someone that you don't like what they're doing, right? Mm-hmm. Very quickly and at the time. So you don't let this bottle up inside you, which would cause resentment, and it could cause an explosive temper. What you're doing is getting it out there in a nice way, but you let people know what you don't like, and that is great. So that would be called a defensive trait. It could even be called a negative trait, right? If I said you had the possibility to maybe have a bit of a temper, just a little bit of a temper, mm-hmm. um, which is used well and directed well, but it keeps you from holding it all in and exploding. So this is why you really have to look at the whole writing before you try to change your writing through graphical therapy. Because you might, if you heard the ter- term temper tick, which is what graphical analysis uses, you might think, oh, that's very negative. I don't want that in my writing. I'm going to take it out. Well, then what would happen? You'd start building up your temper, and you could, you know, become a person with an explosive temper, although with your handwriting, that's very doubtful. But um, this is why you're so open. You have nothing to hide. Uh, you, you let it out there, and then, then you could forgive and forget and move on. People with uh, deeper pressure, you have kind of a light pressure. So you don't hold on to things forever. You can let go. People with a deeper pressure retain their emotions for a long time. So a little danger for a light pressure and a heavy pressure writer is the light pressure writer, they might get into an argument even with a heavy pressure writer. And the light pressure writer will think, oh, that's over. All done. Well, the heavy pressure writer will hold on to that forever. So, especially in compatibility, like in a marriage, you know, the guy, the one of the two, the heavy pressure writer, will be holding on to a grudge. When the light pressure writer will think, I don't even remember, you know, when that. What are you talking about? So there is always things to consider, but if you know about them, you can work them out. Mm. Well, and it, it so is the, the, yeah, the, the, the question then is we, we know that handwriting can reveal one's personality traits, uh, mm-hmm. even a whole, a whole personality in, in a lot of detail. It takes mm-hmm. a lot of evaluation to put these traits together to, to form mm-hmm. an impression of what this person is really like. And some traits... There, there is not a single stroke in the handwriting that will reveal certain traits. It, it, you have to evaluate certain personality traits because of a number of other traits that they have. So it gets increasingly complex to get to the, this detail level. But the, the real question then, I think, for my mother was, since we can get such a vivid portrait of a person's personality from their handwriting, would it be possible for a person who has some negative traits they would like to get rid of or positive traits they would like to acquire to do that by changing their handwriting? And so this book, The Power of Positive Handwriting, really explores that. My mother did years of research. She uh, practiced on, <laughs> on family members like myself. She uh, did research with friends and relatives. This is what you do, of course. And uh, so she developed a system by which uh, you could teach somebody the the individual strokes in in your handwriting that reveal, let's say, procrastination. And you could teach, you could give somebody some exercises, some things that they could write repetitively 
And over about a month period, there would be a noticeable change in that trait in the individual. So procrastination would disappear or would, would, would exhibit itself less frequently. And so she, she continued to do this with many, many traits and developed a set of specific exercises, things that you would write that would have a, a large preponderance of that particular stroke in a sentence. And so that's what this book is about. You can go through this book. You can identify a trait that you want to obtain or that you want to get rid of, and you can find exercises that you can do. What it requires is for an individual to exercise some sort of discipline to do these exercises for, say, 10 minutes a day over a month's period, and then to look back on themselves and to see if they, you know, if, if it has made a change in your life. And most people who have done this have said yes. It absolutely has, has changed their personality in those specific ways. And sometimes it was their family members who would come to my mother and say, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> my partner is certainly different than she or he used to be in this particular way. So this became what is now called in uh, grapple therapy, which is using handwriting as a technique to alter your personality. I, I don't think that it would work to completely change one's personality, but to to work on individual traits, to improve them, to accentuate them, to get rid of them, to acquire them, etc. It certainly has proven to work over and over again. So this book is really sort of a toolkit to help anybody determine for themselves which traits they want to work on and how to do some very, very simple exercises to help make changes in their life. Mm -hmm. well, and it do does it. take, like Gary said, about a month because habits are formed within about 21 days. It's quite difficult for a person to sit down and actually do the, um, the therapy that's recommended. And sometimes people will actually develop headaches, that type of thing, and they have to quit for a while. If it's too much, yeah. and the body will actually tell them. You, you know, because you're really, it's, it's a way of reprogramming the, the brain in a way. Mm hmm Right. So I, as a psychologist, I will use this when I need to if someone is suicidal um, and I see it as a handwriting, then we do turn to gravel therapy. And I do tell them, you know, I do see that you're having trouble. And the baseline will go up, and then the baseline is just how you slope your, mm -hmm. your the lines of your writing up. It'll go up for a few words, then down, and then up, and then down. So the writer's trying to pick themselves up by the bootstraps, and then they fall. They get discouraged, and they try it again, then they fall. So that can be a sign of clinical depression where they really do need help maybe an antidepressant or whatever. But actually, I've had pretty good results with the graphic therapy. So I just tell them they're going to have to just write straight across, forget doing the steps, and they're going to have to bring it in as homework. And they have to number the pages and bring it back within, you know, a week or two days or whenever we meet next. And sometimes they just can't make themselves do it, which is fine as long as they do it at all. But the changes that are made so quickly are, they're really amazing. So I yeah. believe that this should be under, within every psychologist's toolbox. Other things right. come too, of course, there's other forms of testing, but this is one that should be available to all psychologists, just as it was before World War II when Hitler shut it down a bit. I think he didn't right. want other people to see his own handwriting. So, um, and Marianne, you may you may you may remember Marianne when uh, we spoke yesterday about you submitting a sample of your handwriting for Jane to analyze. You sent me a sample that was on lined paper, mm -hmm. and I asked you to to do it again without the lines drawn on the paper. What happens is because the slope of the lines that you write that does 
align incline as it moves from left to right or does it decline on the page uh you can't you, you lose that information as a graphical analyst if the paper is lined because we all know that we're supposed to write on the lines and so that forces us to write in a strictly horizontal manner so part of the information that Jane was able to give you in in your analysis was based on the slope of your writing and that's only possible on unlined paper so all of these little things make a big difference mm -hmm. even the pen that you're using makes a difference so I usually ask people to write with a medium ballpoint pen so that it's all standard and I can read off that. But also if they write with uh, an instrument that they love, that is easy in their hand, that's okay too. So because it tells something about the person, what type of pen that they select. So. You know, I found it very interesting. I mean, we've got the beginning of the year coming up. You know, one, a couple of the things that people can change is something like good self-control and loves physical therapy. You know, and it's yes. interesting how our handwriting can make an impact in our self-control and also being able to, you know, love being able to get out and do some exercise. Right. And you find that in the lower loops, people who love physical activity. I have descending loops that are longer and wider. So I think, Marianne, you, you do like physical activity. Um, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So people who don't, that's a sign of determination. You've got the energy to finish up, right? Mm -hmm. So people who don't have that, you can work on that too. You can work on making sure your letters descend as much as they go upward. Um, if you're writing all in the upper zone area, there's an upper, middle, and lower zone. The lower zone exhibits the, the desire for physical activity. So you could work on that. Um, if you're just an idea person, you might not finish any of these if your lower strokes don't descend very far. And a lot of people are quitters, right? And that would be a great thing to do for a New Year's resolution. Make sure that your descending strokes come back up to what's called the baseline or just the middle area of the writing. And then you wouldn't quit your projects. But you know what? Well, well you know, what's, inter what's oh. interesting is that for our listeners, you know, all that's detailed in the book. There are examples of what it should look like, and there mm -hmm. are, um, it gives you little sections where you can go ahead and start writing. You can do this on plain paper, you know, as mm -hmm. Terry was saying. But it gives you the opportunity to see what it needs to look like. And it's, it's got all these fabulous examples that someone can pick up the book, The Power of Positive Handwriting, and start implementing those changes today. Right. Mm -hmm. I have to say that my my mother uh, was was really an amazing person, mm -hmm. but she also um, knew that she had some issues that she had to work on. So you, she used graphotherapy herself, uh, and she also uh, periodically saw a psychiatrist um, in Minneapolis just to help her work through some issues. So she was very enlightened in that way. She had no fear of that. It didn't see any uh, negativity to seeing the shrink. Uh, and uh, her psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Shapiro, was so impressed with my mother's ability to determine people's handwriting and to, uh, and to assist them with graphotherapy. He started to use it himself. So he first did it himself. And found that he was able to modify his personality in some desirable ways and was so impressed with that and how quickly it worked that he started also using it with uh, with his patients. So uh, there are doctors, there are a number of there are neurologists and psychologists who are using these tools. Not everybody is, but we're very pleased that uh, more and more of them are doing that. Uh, I have to say also that my mother wasn't above assigning her children 
uh, some of grapho therapy assignments to improve ourselves. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, I I won't get into the details of what she asked me to do, but uh, she said there was one trait that she would love to see me eradicate. <laughs> and uh, oh. uh, I have to say that I found it very difficult to do the exercises. I wanted to do it because, of course, I, I was her son, and I wanted to please my mom, and this was a simple way of doing it. And I thought, I, I don't really know if this is going to make any difference to, to me in my personality, but I can certainly spend 10 minutes a day writing these things down and practicing these strokes. And it, it did change, and the change has stuck, and I have virtually eliminated that trait, which I didn't like either. And uh, so I, I, I became a, a firm believer in the effectiveness of this, and it may not work for everybody. But I think that the key factor in success is having enough discipline to actually just do the little writing exercises every day for a month. Mm-hmm. It's very hard for right. us because we're also time-strapped to actually do that. And you can actually tell discipline, a trait like discipline in one, one's handwriting. I don't know what you do if somebody shows a lack of discipline and then assign them something that requires discipline to improve it. <laughs> I don't know how that would work. <laughs> Well, you know, and there are some people who have impulse control problems, like all these shootings, right? Yeah. I was asked once to do an analysis of the Virginia Tech shooter, and I knew what I would be looking at. The writing was full of blotchiness, um, muddiness, which I, I think I pointed out before, the rhythm. There was no rhythm. He, his impulse control was virtually gone. So if they... Could, if somebody could have just seen that before he did the shooting, they could have helped him, I think. Um, so if we can get to the person before, if somebody would recognize that, they can be helped. There was a woman who was, uh, she was a social worker and a grapho analyst, and she worked for a judge in Colorado with delinquent kids, and she really helped. She worked right with the judge, and she could tell if they were ready, you know, to go out into the world again. Or And she worked with them individually and grapple therapy and changing their writing. And they were very, they liked it, um, anything to improve themselves. So they weren't just a bunch of nasty kids. They wanted to yeah. improve themselves, but they didn't know how. And she showed them how, and they loved it, and they went on to succeed the kids who got the help. But a lot of, sometimes handwriting is confused to the occult. And I think this is because of possible lack of certification. Like I said before, I think it should possibly be under the Board of Psychology scrutiny. Um, and because it is so mysterious, it is amazing, right? So... You do think, hey, right. yeah, this person is safe. It seems almost like magic sometimes. Yeah. It is, right. So yeah. it's almost too good to be true. So yeah. I think that's where people get it confused with the occult. But in, I think, the sub- late 70s or 80s, the Library of Congress changed handwriting analysis from the occult to personnel selection and personality. So it's sufficiently changed, at least in the occult. Once in a while, you'll find it in the library under the occult section, but usually now it's under self-development, that type of thing, or even psychology. So we are changing, and I think this is going to get a lot stronger as the neurologists and educators get into it, more than just the personality and character because they do know that kids just retain the information better, and that's a big thing to educate. Right. Hmm. Right. They they do talk about retraining your brain, you know, and Mm -hmm. and this is science. So they they better pull it out of the wrong section and put it where it's supposed to be. (laughs) Where it's supposed to be. Well, Well, this has happened with a number of topics, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, As as, uh, society has learned more about certain things, uh, those techniques or those sciences have become more acceptable. Um, 
Mm-hmm. So this this is no different. It, it takes a while for these things to to become accepted, but this has been accepted in the medical community for quite a while now. Right, and it was at one time accepted by psychologists, which is a bit frustrating because in Europe it was taught in in Russia. Russians use it, and they use a system of graphoanalysis, which is interesting because a lot of countries don't. They've developed their own system and they have their own societies. So it's a shame we don't all get together. But I can see how, you know, in Europe it's still everything is far away. A little away different. In Europe. Right. right. And, but even in this country we can't get together. And that's been my stance. You know, why can't we at least get together in this country? to do it all in a standardized manner. But people are, are just into their own systems. So it's it's very difficult, I think. So it needs to be yeah. either, I think, one, one um, supervised entity, such as a board, I think, of psychology, psychiatry, neurology, um, maybe all of them. So. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. And even it. ethical use, uh, people are still using it as entertainment, and that destroys the image too. Like when I, as a psychologist, would go out and do the ink blot, the Rorschach test as it was entertainment. Well, I'd be let go as a psychologist mighty quick. But people can go out and do handwriting analysis. I wouldn't as a psychologist, but other people do, and it kind of takes away from the professionalism. It does take away from the professionalism. Just about everything can be misused. Right. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some people try to learn handwriting analysis or graphology as a means to get back at people, to say, this is what's wrong with you, and that type of thing. So I always have whatever person I'm analyzing, I have to have their permission so my best friend's daughter was getting married, and she had a sample of handwriting from her fiancé, and she wanted me to analyze it. And I said, no, I won't do it unless I have his permission. He can put it in a sample of handwriting, and that Jane Howell says my permission to analyze the sample, because I knew that this girl, you know, I love her dearly, she's like a second daughter to me, would say when she got mad at her husband, well, Jane says, you're this and this and this. So I wrote down what I said. You know, yeah. so I wouldn't yeah. have been doing anyone any favors, I think, to... Yeah, I'm trying to get um, out of that, just go to that mix. Well, Dina, what's so great is that, you know, we can use this for our own personal... Um, just our own personal development, which I think mm-hmm. is fabulous. And people, it is. I think it's yeah. the best pick up the way uh, to their do own that. copy mm-hmm. of the, the power of positive yeah. handwriting. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Gary and Jane, where can people connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about the book and where they can pick the book up? Well, there is some contact information in the book itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can be reached uh, through my publisher directly by email. That's info, I-N-F-O, at Calumet Editions, C-A-L-U-M-E-T Editions.com. That's the email address. I get every email that is sent there uh, that is addressing me. And that's the best way to reach me directly. So if somebody has questions about this or if somebody has some some good or even bad results as as a result of using the tools in this book, I would certainly love to hear about it. We cert- we have a collection of of endorsements from people who have been helped by it, but I'm I'm always looking for more feedback on what we're presenting in this book. So I hope people, if they they buy this book and they use it and they find it of use or not, that they'll let me know about it. And I am working on reconstructing a website. Um, it would be careerdevelopmentconsultants.com, but it's under construction right now. Uh, and it'll be concerning handwriting analysis, primarily. I, I do work with people with anxiety, so there'll be some 
information on that, too. Anxiety is a large uh, problem in the United States. Some people can't even leave their homes. So I work a lot with these people, and I will use grapple therapy. Just to point out the good traits on them, some of them have never been validated by anyone. So it's it's funny when you start analyzing their handwriting and you pull out good traits, they'll physically change. And their posture, even their complexion will change from pale to they'll get a little color on their face. So yeah. And they'll sit forward and not back. So it, it's such a valuable tool just to bring out the good in others. And even if you don't see a lot of good, you can find something in there. I call it surface diving for the good. So you have to move some of the negative away. You know, you could always yes. pull out something good. And people are so happy to, and so motivated, I think, um, to get out there more. Then they're not so afraid to leave the house or to be seen. But some people are very used to criticism. So they, they don't want to risk it. They don't want to even leave the house anymore. That's getting to be a real problem, with, especially with school kids, both high school. Hey, maybe we should do a book on that. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I think so. That sounds like yeah. a great idea, right? <laughs> yes, well, it does. It right? does. Mm-hmm. You know, Japan, that's their number one health problem, not just mental health, but overall health, because these kids graduate from school if they can, but because trades are not accepted, and Japan, they'll actually bring in people to do the trades, trade work that's not um, acceptable to do for a well-to-do family. The kids are just, they don't know what to do with themselves. They can't get a job because there are only so many management jobs. So they feel like failures, and they're competing with even their friends. And they have some way to connect socially over the Internet, but usually they stay in their room. Their parents deliver the meals to their room. They won't even come out and eat with their parents. So, and now these kids are getting to be middle-aged, right? So the gover- their government is seeing that they're going to have to take care of these people. And it's a bad way to, for them to look at it. If they didn't take care of them, the person would have to get out. They'll want to eat, right, that type of thing. But if the parents right. die off and these kids are left alone, if the government takes care of them or finds a way to, and they're trying to, there's a lot of consideration, a great deal of money is going into this. It's called Hikikomori in Japan, if people want to look it up. Here, it is here. I, I've seen many parents call me that the child, it's not a child anymore, it's a grown-up, won't leave the house to even come to my office. So you know, it's, it's, it's called it's meat amazing. here, not in book. Hmm? Mm-hmm. Well, and it's it's amazing to see how this all comes together because when we talk about, right. mm-hmm. you know, previously we've had Gary on the show to talk about letters from Elvis and the handwriting right. analysis that was done with that. And today the power of positive handwriting. I can't wait to see what comes from the both of you next <laughs> because I'm sure you, <laughs> you have another book um, just, that's just brewing right now. But I'd like to Well, it may have been born right here on Moments with Marianne. <laughs> Uh-huh. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll have to interview you first. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about this today. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh well, thank you both. It's been Word a pleasure to have you both here. My goodness. The Power of Positive Handwriting is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and of course, you can ask for it in any of your indie bookstores. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. 
Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.